Today, we have a super special guest. This is Dr. Jen Haley. She is a certified dermatologist, and we are here to talk about acne today. As you guys know, this channel is created for women, all things women's health, and obviously our skin and acne plays a huge role in how women feel about themselves. So I'm super excited to have on Dr. Haley today. Hi, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I love collaborating with you. It's just so fun putting our minds together and our different perspectives and our experience. And I always learn so much from you. So thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. I know. Um, so Dr. Haley and I in the past have done uh, a lot of collaborations and we do really, really well together. Um, because what I love about your approach is that you really do take an integrative approach to dermatology. And I think that dermatology, that's so important, right? What goes on in your body shows up on your skin. And I think that a lot of people are missing that. I think dermatology is catching up, right? But I love that you take that approach because some don't. Exactly. It's so obvious to me. I've been doing this for 20 years and, you know, I thought in the beginning that if I just memorize all the facts and all the diseases and all the treatment algorithms, I'd do really well with my patients. And after seeing people over 20 years and actually listening to them and learning about their lifestyle, learning about what affects their conditions, I've realized that not really what I recommend matters. It's everything else they're doing in their life that matters and makes a big difference in their skin. And I have such a, a, a great opportunity to be able to evaluate someone's health by looking at their skin. So when you yeah. look at someone's skin, it's their largest visible organ. So it really reveals what's going on deep inside the body. Mm -hmm. So if your skin is inflamed, probably the internal organs are going to be inflamed as well. Absolutely. And Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's just a, a great opportunity to really get a good idea of somebody's health by looking at their skin and, you know, making recommendations. And a lot of times people might be driven with vanity or wanting to look good, but the recommendations that we can make for the long-term plan, of course, we can throw medicines at you to shut down your immune mm -hmm. response or shut down your inflammation short-term, but long-term, if you follow the lifestyle recommendations we make, then you're going to have great health, vi increased vitality, energy, all of it. I mean, better sex life, everything. So everything yeah. will be improved. And your skin will look better. Yes, absolutely. Well, and you and I were literally just having this conversation about the fact that when it comes to aesthetics and the way you look, right, your vitality, the way you show up in the world matters. And so it's, it doesn't fit in that box of, okay, this is the perfect sphere for beauty, right? But it does. It shows up. It's, it's the way that you engage with other people. Absolutely. And for me, that's spiritual and um, really your vibration and, and the thoughts mm -hmm. that enter your mind. So if you're having negative thoughts and down thoughts, and it's going to project and send this vibrational kind of aura around yeah. you, and you move through the world, you're not as glowing or as radiant as someone who's happy, who's excited about life, who's you know, accepting and loving of themselves and wants to share their best self with others who they want to accept and love without judgment. So all of these things are really just as important as what you put on your face, right? Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. So um, to dive a little bit into acne, I know that one of the things that you're doing right now, um, your license, I think you said in 18 states? I am. Yeah, I am. I've been doing telemedicine for almost eight years. And obviously with COVID, it's really picked up. So, and I don't think people are going to want to go back into the office for acne, you know, unless they're doing treatments. Like I yeah. know you offer some amazing treatments in your office. So that's where I send people to do treatments. You can't, you really shouldn't do treatments at home. There's too many risks and not as many benefits as getting them in the office. But as far as checking in with someone, just making sure you're on target, refining some of the recommendations, those things can be done online nowadays. It's beautiful. Yeah, definitely. So tell me, with a patient who's walking into your office with acne, most of the people who walk into my office with acne have done a bunch of things leading up to this. So what are you finding is kind of your first line recommendations when you're talking to patients? It depends on their type of acne. So teenage acne is going to be different from adult female hormonal acne, which is really a big issue nowadays. And then the different type of acne. So I break 
I break them up into different categories. We have mm -hmm. open and closed comedones, which are basically blackheads and whiteheads. Mm -hmm. So like the rough ones, you could feel like the rough sandy bumps. And um, those are just caused more by plugged up pores, um, oily skin with, you know, the sebum or the oil that gets, uh, uh, the skin cells don't exfoliate properly and they kind of get sticky and they get stuck in the pores. So yeah. that's the blackheads and the whiteheads. And then if they stick around long enough in the pores, what happens is they sometimes rupture under the skin. They cause a whole inflammatory cascade. Bacteria come in and bacteria don't cause it. They're just feeding off of the food of the <laughs> oil and the skin cells because there's plenty yes. of it. And those inflammatory lesions or papules, we call them, which are like the red juicy bumps or whiteheads, those we treat differently. So it depends on the type of patient and what, you know, what type of acne they're having. And that's why I think a lot of the over-the-counter stuff don't really work because they're directed at acne and acne is not as simple. So Absolutely. I think it's great if we break it down and we discuss some of the categories and some of the things that work and don't work for each type. Yeah, I would love that. So let's dive into adult hormonal acne because there's nothing more frustrating, I feel like, for a woman, especially when you've gone through your entire teenage years and you've never had acne and then you hit 35 or 40 and all of a sudden you have acne. And um, it does tend to be a bit more difficult to treat. Um, and it is one of those things where, like you said, I mean, with the over-the-counter products, right, they're going and they're doing the things that they can think of, and oftentimes it's really not mitigating their acne symptoms. So can you dive into your thought process on that? Absolutely. Gosh, that's my favorite thing in the world to treat. So when I trained in the late 90s, I was the only female dermatologist. So all those women wanted to come to me. So I've had a lot of practice and I could see through that and kind of see six months down the road when I'm seeing someone and I have such a great plan for them. Mm -hmm. So first I want to describe it. Typically what we'll see is you get the really deep, tender, painful, yes. red acne around the jaw and the mouth. That, that's mm -hmm. the classic area. And they tend to last forever, like a month. And don't pick them, don't get them extracted because nothing will come out. Mm -hmm. They're pure inflammation. There's no sticky skin cells. There's no pore that's clogged. It's, a very, it's coming from within, so it has to be treated from within. So my first question is often, are you on a hormonal IUD? Because those hormonal IUDs, they build up hormones in the body. And it takes, if you have a hormonal IUD for two years, it's going to take two years at least to clean out those yes. harmful hormones from the body. And you might not have any acne for the first six months. And as it builds up in the fat, it likes to get stored in the fat, it mm -hmm. then causes problems and it takes so much longer to get out. So we have to address that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I love that you just mentioned that because a lot of women, what happens is they go off of the pill and onto a hormonal IUD without realizing that the mechanism of action is really different. And so because the mechanism of action between an oral birth control and a hormonal IUD is different, it actually, hormonal IUDs can raise that free testosterone and can definitely exacerbate acne. And so it's interesting um, because a lot of women will think, well, no, I've been on birth control for years. Completely different mechanism of action. It is. And, you know, mm -hmm. as far as the pill goes, there are some that are better for acne than others. Yes, absolutely. And for women that don't want to have kids anymore, I say the best and safest form of birth control is a vasectomy. I, I actually 100% agree with that. <laughs> My husband asked me years ago, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, a vasectomy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, everyone has their personal choice and I've been on birth control when I was young before I had children and, you know, but if you choose to do it, I'm fine with IUDs. You know, if you're mm -hmm. post having children, just don't do the ones with the hormones because I've seen too many disasters, or, or, you know, with the skin and it's just so hard to catch up and years and years of, of acne treatment to get there. Yeah. Um, so that's my first question. And then I start talking a little bit about lifestyle. I have, uh, you know, we all have this thing in our life that makes us a little angry. Mine is plastic. So I think plastic is just the worst thing we can do for our bodies and the worst thing we can do for the environment. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because they discovered years and years ago that plastic residue, even BPA free, sorry, all the BPs suck. <laughs> and 
it's just yeah, the truth. They do. <laughs> yeah, they all suck. And you know, I just carry this thing around and I drink out yep. of it all the time. This and my up. glass one right here. Yeah, yep. yeah. I'm a little clumsy, so I don't do glass. <laughs> plenty of dents in this, but you know, I just I carry them everywhere and I travel internationally and they're the best number one thing to do. So I, I try to tell people don't drink out of plastic bottles. Don't even buy plastic at the store. Oh yeah, it's in a refrigerator. Do you you know, because we know the heat causes problems with plastic, but yes. before it got to that refrigerator, it was in a lot of heat, trust me. Mm-hmm. Mac when it's being delivered and it's just plastic. It's it's just terrible for the environment because and it's terrible for our bodies because it disrupts hormones. So, you know, they discovered this in frogs years and years ago where uh-huh. uh streams, I think it was off the Potomac, were polluted and the frogs that were male started to develop female uh, organs and vice versa. So it just completely messes up hormones in the body for men and women. That's why women end up getting hair and acne and men end up getting little Buddha pregnant bellies, right? Because we're, we're messing with our hormones. Uh-huh. So, you know, love yourself, love your partner, love your children, your boys, if you have children, you know, and your girls. Um, and then BPA does other things, you know, it comes from receipts. So at the grocery store, I usually say, no, thank you. I don't need my receipt. I don't want to touch the receipt. And if you have hand sanitizer and you touch the receipt, you're getting BPA even at a higher, um, higher concentration than without the, the, uh, the hand sanitizer. So that's even getting worse now. And then cans. So unfortunately, I grew up pretty poor in you know, inner city New York. I didn't even know what a fresh vegetable besides iceberg lettuce tasted like until after I graduated college. Mm-hmm. So I had plenty of canned peas growing up. And those cans are lined with BPA most of the time. So I don't know if the cardboard ones are. Like if I get soup for the kids, I usually will get it in cardboard. But I don't know. Do you know if that's lined? I don't actually know. I don't think that they are. And you can get BPA-free cans, cans. right? Yeah, as well. but um, I don't actually know the answer to that question. That's a really good question. I've just always kind of wondered. I assume that the reason they did it in those containers was not to have BPA, but then you wonder, you know, like, yeah, do the, do the Starbucks cups have what is that shiny layer? Is that BPA, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just recommend stainless steel water bottles, glass containers for eating and storing food, mm-hmm. and um, and then just carrying a water bottle pretty much everywhere. And then I talk about diet. So number one is dairy. Yes. Dairy, dairy, dairy. So when I trained, we when I trained, we were told food makes no difference. It doesn't affect your skin. And I was a nutrition major undergrad. So mm-hmm. I believe that, but I still I talk to my patients. I like to talk. And I had many, many patients over the years on Accutane. You know, Accutane will get rid of every type of acne. Yes. <laughs> you know, but they go home over Christmas and they come back and they were eating junk and they break out. And they say, Mm -hmm. well, I ate all this food. Okay. Well, your triglycerides are elevated and you have acne now. And now I'm pretty clear it's related to diet, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just kind of paid attention over time and that more recently the studies are supporting it. So we now have scientific literature supporting that 100% of the time dairy affects everyone, inflammation, uh, personally, I get hoarse. I lose my voice if I have too much dairy. Mm-hmm. So I get like, I get the, the reflux. Some people have problems with that. Yeah. And um, the, the other thing I noticed is I've done fitness competitions and people say they don't have dairy, but what happens is they're supplementing with protein. So you have to start looking at the bars because there's a lot of whey and casein protein in, in drinks and in bars and things like that. So that's yes. another issue with dairy. Well, and I think that's a really good point to bring up. So there's a couple things with dairy when it comes to the skin. So what's interesting is that uh, the research definitely shows that skim milk is the worst offender. And so people think they're going skim, they're going more healthy, but skim milk actually will raise your prostaglandins more and actually make acne worse, worse than anything else. Um, But it's also important because like with food, with food sensitivities, a lot of the time in my office, patients will say, Things like, oh yeah, well I drink lactose-free milk. Lactose-free milk is the sugar, right? So the sugar is lactose, we're getting rid of the sugar, but you need to look at the at the proteins, which is casein in the way. So I'm super glad that you brought that up. Exactly. And I feel and, like casein is more inflammatory. What's your experience? I also feel like casein is more inflammatory. Yeah. I feel like if you just get a whey protein isolate, there's a lot of patients that do not do very well with dairy that will that can tolerate a certain amount of whey protein isolate. Um, so I do, I do actually find that that's 
that I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I just try to make sure that they do grass fed whey and grass fed yeah. collagen just because yes, it's a completely different food if an animal's grass fed than if it's fed corn and Skittles. <laughs> Well, and if you think about what collagen is, right, you're literally eating the cartilage. And so what are you going to do? Eat the cartilage of something that's not fed something very, like that's not fed a good diet. That doesn't sound like a good idea. So um, yeah. when you kind of think about it and break it down, I feel like it makes a lot more sense. You know, um, I think it does to us. We see it all the time, but I don't think most people connect it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's so interesting. I was actually at an international dermatology symposium two years ago, I think. And I was so surprised because they were talking about, there was um, obviously a lecture on nutrition and the speaker actually still said, we're not really sure if diet affects the skin. And I, I just looked around the room thinking, is everybody else listening to this? Like, Am I being punked? But it's, it's interesting. It's, it's catching up, but it's not quite there. Um, so is there anything else diet wise that you really, oh, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a whole, it's really divergent. There's people that are just super closed minded. They don't want to connect it. And I think the people that do the practitioners that do want to share the knowledge are the ones that are willing to do the work themselves. And, you know, I, I really believe all the answers that we need for everything in this world come from us and come from nature. And yes. I'm not really big on externalizing for a pill, you know, and I'll, I don't have a problem giving people pills for short periods of time until the lifestyle can kick in mm -hmm. because it may, you know, and there are some great medications we can talk about for hormonal acne that work really well until lifestyle kicks in. Um, sugar hundred percent of the time is associated with acne. And even my kids will say, they'll be like, oh, I had too much sugar last week. I have acne this week. They'll even notice the pattern. So yes. they're super intuitive that way. So um, it's not just sugar directly, right? So if you have pasta that converts to sugar, like our body is really smart. I actually have a continuous glucose monitor on. You can see it right here. And it's pretty interesting because I had some granola. I went mountain biking this morning and then I had, I craved granola after I mountain bike. It's weird. And my glucose like it went so high. I'm not even going to say almost 200 from the granola. Well, that wasn't sugar, right? That was oats. Yep. Yeah, there's sugar in it. <laughs> and, yeah, there's sugar. But I mean, the same thing happens to me if I have potatoes or if I have carbs, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and some people are more sensitive than others, which is why I'm checking. So I'm aware of what foods I'm sensitive to. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the higher the sugar level goes in your body, the more it causes the insulin surge, which is the same thing that we're seeing with the dairy that, that, insulin growth factor causes basically the oil and then the skin cells to get sticky and it kind of causes all this congestion and clogging in the face and inflammation on top of it. So it's a whole cascade that, that kind of happens. Um, and then the last thing is uh, processed foods. And that really is just because our body needs a time of rest where it can have autophagy or clearing up. So mm -hmm. uh, it kind of renewal yeah. And regeneration that happens overnight. So I think of it as like the kitchen, right? If you're cooking all day in the kitchen, but you're never cleaning the dishes and you're never cleaning the counters, things get piled up. So if we're eating all the time, especially if we're eating chemical laden foods, it's taking a huge amount of energy from our body to clean those chemicals out that it doesn't have the energy to repair and renew the skin and kind of keep it glowing and healthy, you know? Yeah. So we need to take a break. I like having, you know, time restricted eating and we also need to stay away from chemicals. So our body doesn't get worn out kind of cleaning out the chemicals. Like if you have soda, your, your body's going <laughs> to, Northeastern came out there. Soda. It did. Um, it did. It came right out. <laughs> I hear it. I know. The, um, if you have soda, I mean, your body, think about all the energy your body has to go through in order to turn it into water. <laughs> yep. Your body just wants water, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And then I, we can talk about supplements a little bit too, because I know you're big on that. Yeah. I think that that would be, um, great. We should talk about supplements. And I also think we should talk about some of the treatment options, like what people should be putting on their skin, what they should be avoiding. What are the topical options that you're talking about to your patients? Yeah. Is there anything else you recommend from a dietary perspective? No, you really hit it from a dietary perspective. For me, I also agree with time uh, with the time restricted eating. For me, I'm really big on eating um, three 
bigger meals. I don't like when my patients come in and are grazing all day long because you're constantly just training your insulin to spike, right? Yeah. As opposed to utilizing your glucose effectively. And so that I think is, is big. And then mostly what I'm seeing with the skin is honestly mostly dairy, um, mostly dairy and then the refined sugars. I do think that the continuous glucose monitoring is really interesting. It's something that I definitely do want to like experiment with more. I haven't experimented with it at all. So I'm interested to hear your, like to eventually hear your experience with that. It's, it's super eye, eye opening. I, um, I follow David Sinclair's work. He uh -huh. does longevity research out of Harvard and, um, he, uh, you know, he talks about autophagy, you know, the time for your body to kind of clean up. So if I notice my skin kind of getting sallow or, I don't know. I feel sluggish. I'm like, okay, it's time for my body to have a chance to clean up. So with aut for, in order for to autophagy to kick in, exercise helps that, but also um, fasting. So it kicks in after 24 hours and it maximizes it four days. And I mean, even he doesn't do four days. So I did 24 hours last week and then I went for a mountain bike ride and I, was, I lost my appetite. You know, when you go in ketosis, you kind of lose your yeah. appetite. Once you get through the miserable, miserable period <laughs> and my sugars were like 52, 59 and I couldn't get mm. them back up. It was so interesting, you know, and it's just, it's interesting just to see how things affect you. I'm not advocating that everybody does it. You kind of, that is interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, so let's, um, the other thing I do want to mention, because I mentioned this to my patients is, uh, a lot of this we're talking about with hormones, right? So you know better than anyone that mm -hmm. stress and cortisol is going to throw off all of your hormone levels. Mm -hmm. So I am a huge advocate of meditation and deep breathing. And I've always yeah. been kind of type A and people used to say, you need to meditate. And I said, I get a massage once a week. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's my meditation. <laughs> I know. And it's just really, really different to yeah. actually meditate and just kind of breathe and be alone with your thoughts. And whether you do the Andrew Weil, like four, seven, eight breath or four breath, you know, count of four in, yeah. hold for seven, exhale for eight, or you meditate to an app like Headspace or Calm, or you do, there's so many different types of meditation. The power of breath is so amazing. It's just balancing things out, perspectives and hormones. Yes. Well, we, and we know that cortisol affects not only your sebum production, so it affects the oil that you make on your skin as making it more thick, right? Um, but on top of that, cortisol is going to affect inflammation. And what I tell my patients is that uh, inflammation affects the way you use your hormones at a cellular level. It affects all of your hormones at a cellular level, the way that you utilize them. And so um, that's really important. And I also... The other thing that I talk to my patients about with inflammation is actually going to be GI health, right? Because we know that um, changes in microbiota can also affect infl inflammation, which again, changes the way that we utilize our hormones. So um, I am really excited, but I have not seen, I'm interested to hear what you think. I have not seen research on the microbiota in the gut yet that's like, boiled down to a practice usable level. It's all very high level, I think, in terms of the science. And we haven't quite figured out how to get it down to the patient level yet. But what we do know is that the gut microbiota does affect the skin and that the skin also has its own separate microbiota. Yeah, you know, the one thing I'm struggling with, and I, I don't think we have answers yet, unless you're aware of newer research, is like probiotic, I mean, prebiotics matter, probiotics, all of that. Yep. But we don't really know which ones work the best for particular conditions. And I think that's yep. why it's not so easy to just take a probiotic and make it all balanced. You kind of have to live the life to support healthy gut bacteria, right? Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. So unless you're like, just came off of an antibiotic or have like a very strong history of antibiotic use, those kind of things. But we don't, we, that's exactly what, how I feel about it. I feel like there's a lot of research going on, but we haven't been able to tailor it to patients yet. I I'm agree. I for when that happens, but. Yeah, no, I agree a hundred percent. And it's really, 
it's a little frustrating for me because we do use a lot of antibiotics in dermatology for acne and rosacea, mm -hmm. and they work not because we're treating an infection because they're anti-inflammatory. So we're kind of just treating the symptoms by suppressing the inflammation with yeah. the antibiotic short term, and it works great short term. But I always know in my heart that long term, I'm kind of messing up their their microbiome, whether it's their skin or whether it's their gut, you know, so short term results for a long term harm is really what I've observed over 20 years. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. And so I will say that the majority of like hormonal acne patients that are coming in my office, um, their treatment options that they're being given are probably uh, doxycycline is very common to help balance out the inflammation. Um, so what are you doing in your office? Like, what are your treatment, your go to treatment? For teens, I do do doxy often. So with teenage acne, the, the goal, the, the perspective I have and that I share with the patients to make sure they're on board is basically to make your acne good enough until you outgrow it, right? And yeah. to prevent long-term scarring. And doxy is the, the best um, anti-inflammatory. It has the most anti-inflammatory properties of all the cyclins mm -hmm. compared to tetracycline or minocycline or sericylin. I can never, never say that one. And... Uh, the other thing I like about doxycycline is it inhibits matrix metalloproteinase. Mm -hmm. So MMP or matrix metalloproteinase, MMP, it basically breaks down the collagen in your skin. So when you get a really inflamed acne and then the reason you get a divot or you know, an, you know, an ice pick scar there afterwards is because that inflammation basically damage the collagen permanently in the area. So mm -hmm. that's why I like, I tend to aim towards doc, doxy. Now in adult female hormonal acne, I never give antibiotics. I always go for a medication called spironolactone. Yep. And you've heard of that, right? Okay. Yep. Absolutely. And yeah. And you know, once again, it's a short term fix until we can get those hormones balanced and get rid of the exogenous hormones that don't belong there and kind of rebalance things, which can take six to nine months lifestyle wise. But yeah. as long as, yeah, as long as someone doesn't mind, you know, as long as they're not planning on being pregnant, I love spironolactone. It works a hundred percent of the time at the right dosing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Spironolactone so. is a great treatment. Um, it, it is a great treatment option for hormonal acne. Um, what about topical? Like, what are you doing topical? So can I just talk really quick about how spironolactone works, how I explained yeah, it? Please do. I know you please have do. a yeah, I know you have a pretty intelligent, you know, clientele. So they'll probably be interested in knowing how it works. So um, basically, if I just say you have acne, if I'm seeing someone with acne and I measure their hormone levels with the current lab measurements that we have now, they'll probably come out to be normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're they're normal by standards, but there's, their body's not re reacting to those hormones in a normal fashion, right? They might have some hair growth here, which people don't usually like to talk about it, but I know it's there. And a little more oil and then the acne, right? And um, so what happens with the spironolactone basically is I say the skin has little receptors. There's little catcher mints. And every time the hormones cycle through the body, they grab onto the hormones quicker than other people who don't have acne, right? Mm -hmm. So what spironolactone does, it takes a couple months to start working and it fills those receptors, those receptors, those little mitts. So guess what? The hormones just drive on by and they don't get in the receptors and that's why the acne will fade over time. So mm -hmm. it kind of mimics the hormone a little bit by filling those receptors so that the hormones can't fill them and cause hair and you know, I, it works for oil. It works for hair. Okay. But we need much higher doses than we do for acne. And it also yeah. helps thicken hair a little bit. It's not a go-to treatment, but they're all kind of related, you know, with PCOS kind of stuff. Yeah. Most of the time, the only time I see, most of the time when I see spironolactone, um, for thinning hair, it's mostly given in menopausal women who are on pellet therapy. And so they've been given really high doses of testosterone, and then they're given spironolactone to offset their pellet okay. therapy. That's mostly when I see it for, um, mostly um, my experience using it. And when it comes into my office, it's mostly for hair growth on the face and acne. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I go to finasteride in those women. You know, just um, I also would go to finasteride in those women. Yeah. It's really funny because most of the time when I inherit, I say like pellet okay. patients from other clinics, um, most of the time it's spironolactone that I see them coming on. Even yeah. though I wouldn't necessarily go to that medication first for that, but that's not a, 
yeah, I'm not against it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, do you see that it works? Um, honestly, it wouldn't be my go-to treatment plan. So they usually come in and they're saying, yeah, it helps a little bit. Like it has helped. It was way worse before. Um, but we are usually overhauling their treatment plan at that point. So I don't necessarily have to keep them on it. Okay. Because you usually will just reduce their pellets. Uh, normally use a different form of, yeah, because yeah. at that point they're over medicated and right. then yeah. we need to kind of treat the yeah. actual cause of what's going on. So, okay. um, that's normally my style, but so I, I don't prescribe it for that, but I do see it a lot for that, which is interesting. Okay. Okay. That makes um, sense. Yeah. I think that's the, the problem I have with, uh, traditional medicine is it's so reactive and mm -hmm. it, it, they just keep adding more medication to cover the side effects of the previous medication. So sometimes I'll even tell people like, Hey, get off your Prilosec, like get off your, the, the medic, you know, your proton pump inhibitors that are messing up your, your microbiome in the first place, because I'd rather deprescribe just like you. It just yep. makes more sense yep. to kind of simplify it, clean it out, let your body do the work, right? Let your body heal itself. Absolutely. Well, and we know that with, with medications like Prilosec, they affect the way that you absorb your minerals, right? And so if we're talking about acne, one of the supplements that you may consider for acne would be zinc. And yeah. you don't <laughs> absorb your zinc very effectively if you're on a proton pump inhibitor. Yeah. I like fish oil. I like zinc. And then I'll do vitamin A and D. I just give every, I tell everyone they need D because, you know, that's true. Um, yeah. I'll do niacinamide and probiotics. And yep. sometimes a B complex, in, I usually do B complex and magnesium because our soil is so deficient. I think everyone needs those anyway. But yep. for acne in particular, fish oil, probiotic, zinc, I do like 25 to 30. I think you're a little higher, aren't you? Um, I do 30. Usually I'm okay. about 30, 30 to 50, depending, but usually it's about 30. Because people yeah. need to be reminded, right, that zinc and copper use the same receptor sites. And so zinc is not something that you want to take in high doses long term because you're going to throw off your copper. Um, and iron and iron too. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Those are exactly my go-to. So like fish oil is a must if you have, um, if you have hormonal acne because that inflammatory process, right? We know fish oil is one of the most anti-inflammatory things that you can take supplement wise. Um, and then a probiotic and zinc are my go-to and then vitamin A I love, um, yeah. especially in higher doses, but with vitamin A, you really need to be seen by a professional because it's similar to being on Accutane, right? Like you can't be taking a higher doses of vitamin A if you have any intention of being pregnant, which I always remind my patients of, because sometimes patients will listen and be like, Oh, I need vitamin A. Um, <laughs> that is not a good one to go and supplement on your own. So yeah. I completely um, agree. What probiotic? Probiotics do you like? I really like, so um, my favorite probiotics are probably the Therbiotic by Claire. Um, okay. And I like everything Claire has. I like their women's health probiotic. I like their Therbiotic. I like their Saccharomyces boulardii. Um, if you have like a very specified GI case. Um, but I also really am liking the Megaspore biotic. Um, I love Megaspore. Yeah, that's my go to is the Megaspore. Yep. That one has my seeds. It's great. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. That's <laughs> oh, been more my go-to lately too. Oh, okay. Okay. And I think it's interesting what you said about the fish oil because a lot of people who have oily skin don't want to hear that they have to take oil, right? Because it's mm -hmm. so ingrained. Like, I'm not going to take oil. My skin is oily. And they, they don't understand your skin is oily because it's imbalanced with inflammatory oils. So we have to put anti-inflammatory yes. oils in there in order to calm down the inflammation. It's counterintuitive for a lot of people. It is counterintuitive. And that goes right along with hydration, right? Because one of the things that I see in most acne patients is that they really want to dry out their skin. And, and so a lot of them do not want to hydrate um, their skin as much as they should. So they a lot of my acne patients will stick away from moisturizers or um, yeah, anything hydrating because they're worried that they're gonna, that it's gonna give them more acne. Yeah. And so I think that uh, the fish oil is exactly, it's very similar to that. They think, oh, my, my skin is already producing oil, so I don't need this. For sure. But actually, if you hydrate your skin, your skin will produce less oil because it's overcompensating for the dryness. 
hundred percent, hundred percent. And then those, yeah, hundred percent. So topically, all right, do you want to talk about prescriptions first or yep. over the counter? Uh, for prescriptions, you know, it depends on someone's insurance, but in my ideal world, I like a medication called Axone or uh, the generic form of that is Dapsone. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Yeah, and it just kind of chases away neutrophils and inflammation. So I, I find that it works really well for redness. So I like it for um, female acne or anyone who's super red. It kind of calms things down. Mm -hmm. So I'll usually use, uh, if they have great insurance, you can get the 7.5% and that's once a day. And if not, you can do the 5% and it's generic and that's a twice a day application. Mm -hmm. And I'll usually apply that as the first step after cleansing. And then as far as what I like them to cleanse with, it would be... Um, a salicylic acid moisturizer because it, it has a, an exfoliating effect. It has an anti-inflammatory effect mm -hmm. and just letting it sit on the skin for about two minutes before rinsing. Uh, I usually add a retinoid in almost every one, something mild, like different. It just really depends on how inflamed their skin is. And that's about as far as I go. Simple is better. It goes back to a uh, lifestyle. And then I do recommend moisturizers. I like uh, hyaluronic acid for people just yes. because you know, it draws in a thousand times its weight in water and it doesn't add any oil. So it's hydrating without adding oil. And uh, yeah, that's where I go with that. What about you? Um, I would say mine's very similar. So I would do a salicylic acid based cleanser. Um, normally for an anti-inflammatory, I will use Dapsone, but I will also use um, some, there is a product that I love from the line that I carry. It's called Pro Heal. Um, and it is a, a natural vitamin A, but also vitamin C based product. It's super anti-inflammatory and I have seen it work amazing in um, cystic acne as well as rosacea patients. Um, it just really calms down that redness and inflammation. So that's normally it, my go-to first. Does it have niacinamide in it maybe? Because vitamin C can be irritating to some people. That's why I, I'm hesitant with it does not have niacinamide in it. Um, it's vitamin C low is a very low, very um, low dosage of vitamin C. It's not a high, it's not potent. Um, I can't remember what other herbs are in it because it is like a botanically based product, but it's very anti-inflammatory. Patients really do very well on that. Um, and then I will do a retinol. Um, I do find sometimes in Arizona that retinols, sometimes patients struggle with retinols a little bit or they'll overuse them a little bit. Um, kind of being here, being in the desert, being a bit dry. Um, yeah. So I definitely have my patients work their way up to that. Um, and I know some patients do struggle with working yeah. with retinols. The for sure, for sure. And so there's retinol, there's retinaldehyde, and then there's uh, like the retin-A or the yeah. all-trans retinoic acid. And all of those convert eventually into all-trans retinoic acid. So if you use a retinol, you need 10 times as much to get the same amount as your, your retin-A or your mm -hmm. retinoic acid. So I'll usually start people on a retinol that's weaker at first. And the thing that... Um, Oh, you know what? I wrote down here the three biggest mistakes. The, the three most common mistakes with acne treatment is, and this reminds me, what you just said reminds me of it because people use too much that causes irritation and they give up on treatment. So a little bit goes a long way, especially when you're using medical grade, high quality cosmeceuticals and not over the counter stuff. So I usually say a little size of a pearl on the tip of your finger, mm -hmm. dot, 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 dot and just massage it in and try to avoid the creases here and the creases here where it will enhance the exfoliation of your skin. So mm -hmm. retinoids don't dry out the skin. They're just exfoliating the skin. And we want to do that at a microscopic level, not mm -hmm. in a chemical peel form. I mean, if you want to ride through it, you'll get results quicker, but you know, three times a week after six, at six months, you're at the same pace as you would be if you did it every day. Yeah. Uh, if you said, if you do it every day, you'll get there a little bit quicker, you know, but then at six months, you're both in the same place. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing with retinoids to help decrease irritation is we used to say not to use it with moisturizer because it actually uh, caused dilution and it wasn't as effective. And then we said we could put the moisturizer on afterwards when it dried. And now the newest studies show that you want to put like your hyaluronic acid on first to kind yeah. of, mm -hmm. you know, help your skin barrier. And then what you do is you put your retinoid on afterwards mm -hmm. and it just sort of helps the whole process along. 
Yeah. So, yeah. I think it is interesting how much those recommendations have changed, like, over time. Um, and I know patients are, do much better if they put on their hyaluronic acid before and then put on the retinol, the, um, retinol after. That's what I'm noticing in my patients, that they're doing much better. And you still get results, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So that's what matters. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as we're getting results and we're, we're not getting as irritated. Yeah. Um, well, in the studies on that, I mean, yes, for acne, it is an important part because we are exfoliating the skin, but the studies on actually thickening the dermis are really excellent on retinol as well. So it is a great, just overall anti-aging. Oh, a hundred percent. It's my go-to. I actually take a tube and mix it in my moisturizer and apply it all over. <laughs> <laughs> so it's working, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. So with uh, vitamin C, I get a little hesitant if someone's inflamed because it can be irritating, but if it's 5%, it's not going to cause a problem. It's just when we're going towards 15%. And then glycolic acid, I'm not a big, oh, I think I'm freezing. Okay. <laughs> glycolic acid, I'm not uh, a huge fan on with acneic skin because I find it to be a little bit um, burning and irritating. Mm -hmm. I prefer the salicylic acid like you do. Yes. Although I do like glycolic and kind of aged crepey skin. And I love vitamin C for everyone. Just I'm a little careful about the acne until it kind of gets under control. But I'm curious yeah. as to, the, I guess you don't do show notes. I would put the botanicals on there. I wonder if it's calendula and there's so many. I will. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up because I can't think of what's in it. But like, it's very, very anti-inflammatory. Um, it is hands down one of my favorite products. And I, I agree. I would not do um, a high or dose vitamin C on an acne patient um, because they're just... They're usually too inflamed. Now on on blackheads, absolutely, because you don't want you want to be able to um, stop the skin cells from oxidizing and creating blackheads. And so vitamin C is a great option for that. Um, but other than that, I uh, I actually agree with you. Um, but this particular product, my patients do excellent on. Mm -hmm. um, it's got olive leaf vitamin E, vitamin A, and vitamin C, which is what I thought was in it. And I was like, no, there's no niacinamide in it. Um, yeah, it works great. Interesting. It's like one of my favorite products. Those are the only three things that are in it? Um, there's another secret sauce in there. Vitamin E, retinol, olive leaf, and uh, vitamin C. Oh, is it tocotrienol or tocopherol vitamin E? Um, it is... I don't actually know that off the tip of my tongue. I don't yeah. actually know that. Okay. Sometimes they'll say in parentheses, because tocotrienols are great. Mm -hmm. They're super anti-inflammatory. So I'm wondering, well, that sounds great. What's the name of it again? Proheal. Proheal. Yes. For anything okay. that is like, for any kind of red inflamed skin, yeah. um, it is a really, it's kind of my like first go-to to calm down the inflammation and it works. Okay. Well. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Uh, um, and then I think in terms of patients who are suffering from kind of scarring from their acne, what are your go-to treatments for scarring? I'm going to go to ProHeal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking of when you mentioned it. For post. So after, depending on your skin type, um, after the pimples resolve, Yes. Most commonly, what we'll see is either post-inflammatory erythema, like in someone who's fair skin, they'll get a little red spot. Mm -hmm. And in someone who, like I'm half Spanish, so I would get a, I get dark spots. So when you have like medium skin tone to dark skin tone, you get post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which is like, hey, the party's over, but the pigment cells were all nosy, showed up at the party and never left, right? So you get yeah. brown spots afterwards. So that is usually what bothers people more than the acne itself. Mm -hmm. So I often have an expert, you know, I have to have a discussion saying, let's get rid of the acne because otherwise we're going to be chasing our tail if we just treat the pigmentation and don't treat the cause of it. And then once the acne is under control, it's sunscreen is really important. And I don't do chemical sunscreens. I haven't been an advocate of them in 20 years. And I just use zinc-based sunscreens are, are my favorite and hat use. Don't put a little sunscreen on and go out in the sun thinking you're fine. Like wear a hat, try to avoid the sun during the peak hours. Yes. And, <laughs> and uh, I mean, even when I'm out bike, I have like a wide hat on and then I have my helmet and I get double looks all the time, but I, I'm, it's okay. Um, 
yeah, so sun avoidance, because you can bleach your skin with hydroquinone and really harsh chemicals to bleach the skin. Boom, one day in the sun, it all comes back because those cells have memories. So, mm -hmm. and then you can do all sorts of topicals from licorice to arbutin to kojic acid to lighten that. Um, I just don't stop the acne treatment for at least two to three weeks after everything's gone. So I'll quit the orals. <laughs> I see your look. Yeah, so I'll quit the orals and then I'll continue the topicals and kind of monitor for another month or two. And while they're doing topicals, I might add in a brightening or a lightening kind of solution. And retinoids play a big role in that. So maybe it's time they're acclimated. We can bump up the retinoids. We can add a lightener in the morning and then diligent sun protection. And the body heals itself. We just have to give it time. It takes two to three months for the skin to turn over completely. So any kind of result that we want to see, we have to do the same routine for two to three months and then we get the result. So it's just patience. Yes. Not as patient as hair. No, it's not as patient as hair. No, it's forever. <laughs> um, but I think that is important for patients to recognize because sometimes they are they use a product for a week and then they go, oh no, that doesn't work. Yeah. And oh, you didn't. Yeah, that goes back to my two other mistakes, my common acne treatment mistakes. Okay, so number one is using too much product, like you mentioned yeah. with retinol. And uh, it causes irritation and then you give up, right? Before you even see results. Number two is doing spot treatments. So if you have an acne here, that's two months old. Up here, there's a spot that wants to pop up in your skin that is underneath the layers that mm -hmm. you're gonna chase, right? So you wanna treat everywhere with your acne treatment, never spot treat. You wanna treat the whole area because what we're trying to do is treat the next fresh layer of skin to be clear. And then third, what you just said is quitting too soon. So don't yeah. quit too soon, stick with it for two to three months. Absolutely, um, that is definitely what I talk to my patients about as well. I think that um, oftentimes, I know with acne, it is one of those things that people want treated really, really quickly. And I do get that. Um, but I always tell my patients, it takes you a while to get to the point where you get treatment. And so you have to be a little bit patient to come out of that. Um, and I'm excited about this episode because I, I think that sometimes patients don't know what to do. And I think we hit on a lot of really great things. So diet is a key component. If you are struggling with hormonal acne at home, diet is honestly one of the first places I would start. Now, I also really would start with really good skincare because I think that makes a world of difference. But um, starting with diet and some anti-inflammatory um, supplementation can be helpful as well. Um, so I think we we hit on some really great topics. Is there anything else that you would add? Yeah, I just want to point out that just because you have acne doesn't mean that you have a horrible diet because there's plenty of people out no. there that have a much worse diet and you know their body's showing it in maybe other ways with arthritis or we don't know why the body presents in different ways, but you know, we, we do know that some of us are canaries in the coal mine. So, you know, I have a little finger that gets arthritis when I have gluten. So like, it tells me like, oh, okay. So we all have something, right? And, you know, so don't beat yourself up to say, okay, what can I do better today? And the world isn't like an all or nothing. So yeah, you can have an ice cream sundae in a year. Like that one ice cream sundae doesn't matter. Just don't do it every day. But if you do it, don't, it doesn't mean that you need to say no to everything else. Just, okay, great. I enjoy that ice cream sundae and tomorrow I'm not going to have one, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, a hundred percent. Well, and what I always tell my patients is it's about moderation and figuring out where your threshold is, right? So like there are a lot of acne patients that I have where they do okay with like some harder cheeses and stuff like that, but they can't have milk. Um, and like we said, skim milk's kind of the biggest perpetrator, right? So sometimes it's not necessarily that it's everything, um, but you kind of have to be able to figure out what works and what doesn't. And then and I also think it's really empowering sometimes for patients to understand what gives them symptoms, because then if you have an acne that like an acne lesion that pops up after you've decided to go out and have ice cream. It's kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I did that. 
right? Exactly. But if we're, if, if you're moderate, you're not going to know. So you sort of have to eliminate everything for a good two to three months. Yes. And then you'll have a clear recognition of the patterns that affect you. So we yes. give guidelines and everyone's different. Some people, it doesn't affect them, you know, but these are pretty solid guidelines and what, if you follow it, you can clear yourself. And then once you're clear and you're confident, you can play around with it a little bit and you'll know what, what the triggers are, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I have one question. I have a quick question for you before we close out. So in your office, do you ever do like a, we call it the prom treatment or, you know, like the little injections into an inflamed spot if someone's getting married that weekend or has something going on like a cortis, like a interlegional catalog? So, um, yes, I think that that can be a really great treatment. Um, I, it is something that you can't overdo, that's for sure. Um, but it, I think it can be a good option just to kind of help right away because a lot of the other treatments that i'm doing in my office like microneedling and rf microneedling and things like that can be awesome for acne scarring um and microneedling is a fantastic treatment now i need to just say this isn't the same thing as dermal rolling at home especially if you have acne don't dermal roll because don't do it don't do yeah, it it doesn't no. go deep enough first of all and then second of all if you have acne lesions, you are basically just going to be spreading all your bacteria around. And so it's, it's it tears. Bad. It also tears. So yes. when mm -hmm. you're punching with a stamper in the office to do it, it's different than rolling and tearing. It's, it's, I don't like those stomach rollers. I a hundred percent agree. Um, but yeah, so most of the time in patients, I mean, if I have enough time, I prefer to do something like microneedling or, uh, something like that, but sometimes you just don't. And sometimes you have those stubborn, really inflamed lesions that need a little bit extra. I just find like when someone's under good control and then they might have a little stress because they're getting married or they have some big event coming up and then they just get that one spot, you know, w would that be a time to call you and just say, I need a little spot treatment? Because I would, when I had my office, I would just squeeze those people in real quick and just do yep. like a 2.5 milligrams analog, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And yes, I think that is a fantastic treatment um, yeah. for patients who just need a little something to get them through what they have going on. Exactly. Cool. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. You no know, people can come to you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Haley, for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, and all of our viewers can look for our future um, interviews together because we are going to be doing more interviews on the skin. So if you guys have things or questions that you want answered about your skin, you can drop them in the comments below. And then as always, remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel so that you know when our next videos are coming out. Thanks again, Jen. Anytime. My pleasure.